So Sebastian Holtz <laughs> is the Chief Marketing Officer of Creative Solutions. Sebastian, can you give us the water? Um, Sebastian has held executive product and marketing positions for both public and private software companies. He's been active in both computing and industry standards bodies, including the W3C, which is the governing body for the World Wide Web. And he has served on that advisory committee there for three years. Um, with the exception of a short stint at IBM right out of school, he has worked with startup and emerging technology companies for 20 plus years in his career. So he is truly an expert in this space. And over the past four years, while at Preemptive Solutions, he has helped triple the size of that company and with the rest of the team, want to set a truly exciting course for the future of that company. So he'll give us a really quick snapshot of what they do, but this is right in the space that we all want to be in, which is rapidly growing our companies. Um, today, he's going to share some of his tribal knowledge, that was his word, tribal knowledge, on how to move mountains without breaking the bank. So welcome and thank you, Sebastian. Thank you. Um, Laura Bennett is our second panelist. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Laura is the CEO and co-founder of um, Embrace Pet Insurance, and she is also the chief embracer. With uh, she owns three cats herself. Um, she trained and worked as an actuary at a life and health insurance company in Toronto, and also in Dublin before obtaining her MBA from the Wharton School. And she has a good story about Embrace related to the Wharton School that we'll talk about. Um, she graduated from Wharton as a Palmer and Siegel Scholar, and she wrote a daily blog there about her experiences. And I say that because what uh, Laura's expertise in, among many other things, is how to use social media. And you can see writing a daily blog and coming here and starting a company that she's one of the first um, you know, people who created the blogosphere. So if there's anybody who's an expert in this, it's her. Um, she uh, graduated from Wharton and co-founded Embrace Pet Insurance, where she actively engages with pet parents about pet insurance through all types of media, including Twitter, Facebook, and email. And she has been writing the blog there since 2005. So again, very, very expert, five years at the company blog. <laughs> Laura was the first pet insurance actuary in the US and was named to the Society of Actuaries Top 100 Actuarial Pioneers for her groundbreaking work in pet insurance. And she actually developed the actuarial models behind the leading edge customizable pet insurance product. She is the chairman of the board of uh, NAFIA, the North American Pet Health Insurance Association. So she's clearly risen to the very, very top in her field. Um, and she has a husband and two daughters and enjoys spending time with them as well as her three cats. <laughs> um, and lastly, I'd like to introduce Don Hubbard. Thank you, Don. Um, Don is Senior Vice President of Sales and Marketing at PartSource, and one of the great things Don's going to talk about today is what is the difference between marketing and sales, and how do they interact together as you're trying to generate sales quickly for your early stage company. Don graduated from the University of Michigan. He started his career at Agency Redcar. Oh, Michigan. Um, I don't know if that isn't a bad thing. <laughs> and it's not a bad thing here either. It's a great thing. Um, he uh, obtained positions of increasing responsibility at Agency Renicar and uh, culminated his career there as the VP of Operations, where he then started a new startup firm called Spirit Renicar, and he led the field sales there to tremendous success because they were purchased by National and Alamo, so a, a startup with an exit, which is always a great thing. Um, Don then, sorry, there's so many great things to say, I have to use my notes. Uh, he took over as VP of Sales of an off-airport rental division and led this profitable and growing division until 2003 when he said, I'm going to start this other fledgling startup or work in this fledgling startup called PartSource. So PartSource is no longer a fledgling startup. It is a very, very successful company here. And uh, he can tell you a little bit more about that. He has led the marketing and sales function there in, um, since 2003. They started at $5 million in sales when he was there, and they are now at over $110 million in revenues today. So this idea of marketing and sales, clearly we've got some great results to talk about with that. Um, he is also the 2005 winner of the DMSE Sales Executive for the Year Award in Northeast Ohio. Um, on the personal side, he's very active in his church and in his community. He's on the Chambers of Commerce Board of Directors in both Twinsburg and Aurora, and he supports two other startup firms. Checkpoint Surgical and Imalux in a sales advisory capacity, and perhaps that's why he was just named to the University of Akron Fisher Institute 
for sales and marketing in a board advisory position. So let's put our hands together for a pretty fabulous panel. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our first participant and panelist, which is Sebastian Holtz. Thank you, uh, Kathy, and uh, especially for letting me sit next to the, uh, the, the two esteemed uh, <laughs> presenters. Let's see if I can make this work. All right. So, um, provide actionable advice with real-world examples in 20 minutes. Um, so that, I took that as I, the reason, one of the reasons why I had to be, is I, I love the challenge. I, I think that's, I hope a challenge I'll, I'll meet. And the three things I want to talk to you about are spending your partner's marketing budget, why well, spend yours when you just spend someone else's, <laughs> exert an unfair influence over industry and over the years. We don't want a level playing field except when we can tilt it in our favor, of course. Um, and we want to entice our customers uh, to promote our success. So this sounds like three really great things, fairly ambitious things to do in 20 minutes. And, and I think the key um, is that really, there's, in my view anyway, a single set uh, so principles and, and processes behind all three. So it's really applying a single set of, of uh, they say, processes uh, to achieve really a, a wide variety of very important goals that should have some direct and, and material impact. Um, Kathy asked that we talk about who we are, so I'll just say we make software for people who <coughs> build software. Anybody here build software? Okay, I'll talk to you later. Everybody else. Um, <laughs> suffice to say, it's a very specialized, uh, uh, super exciting, but specialized business. Uh, we, we've been around uh, over a decade, um, and it is you know, start of five, but for software, that's many lifetimes. Um, and I'll say that the credit for that goes entirely to the two founding uh, partners, uh, Gabriel Tark and, and Bill Leach. I had uh, zero to do with that. I've only been with the company for, for just over four years. Um, but surviving is very, very important, but we're not here to survive, we're here to, to break out. Um, and that will be the subject of, of my remaining 18 minutes. Um, so the first thing I want to do is sort of set the stage, at least how, how I see it, because there is really almost a level of certainly schizophrenia, if not you know, profound insanity involved with startups. And I don't just mean the company and the life of of running a small company, but the people who, who actually want to do this for a living. And again, I'm, I'm amongst my own people, so we can say that without offending anyone, but I want to call out uh, two characters that are inspiration to me. Anybody here ever watch Pinky and the Brain? Okay. Everybody. So I can, I'll make this quick. Okay, the principle, the, 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 the recurring theme, if you haven't watched it, Google them, look up their plots, and see if you can't resist downloading and watching this stuff. But every, plot, every episode is ultimately the same. These two lab mice, the lowest of the low. They're little mice, but they're lab mice, subjected to cruel and, and human experiments. Right? But every single episode is about one thing, how they're going to take over the world. And, and of course, inevitably, these things, planes come crashing down by the end of the episode. And then the last line is always, Pinky asking the brain, what are we going to do tomorrow? It's the same thing we do every day. We're going to take over the world, right? And, and that's the mentality, I think, of everybody in this room, right? You're subject to just totally unfair and unreasonable and uncontrollable forces, right? From every side. And for some reason, you still, every single day, feel compelled to take over the world. But what's really important is not to know yourself, but to recognize how different everybody else you're dealing with is from that mindset. Unless you sell to other entrepreneurs. Anybody else here sell to entrepreneurs? as your principal. Okay, well, then you guys can wait till the end. Yeah. But for the most part, okay, this is a very unique view. And so the thing you have to realize is, first of all, nobody <coughs> paints a world view with a hole in the middle. Whether it's an analyst, a customer, a partner, a buyer, okay? If there's a hole, they fill it. If it's a hole they can't fill, they, it's over the horizon, and it's not in their world view. Okay? So, so if you think you're coming in with an answer to some critical problem that they could not have lived without as you walked in that door, recognize you're fundamentally at odds with them. Okay? They don't want to hear it. Nobody buys from a short list of one. But you're unique. Even if you are unique, you've got to find a list. Nobody buys from a short list of one. So you've got to find a way to be on a list. Okay? And nobody cannot lose a value. Okay? 
everybody's doing just fine without you. Okay? So the game changers, in my experience, the people who have been successful, earn the right to influence people. And not just the people they're selling to, but they earn the right to influence. They don't start off influencing because of the brilliance of their idea. Okay? They have to find ways to serve the selfish interests, which are at odds not only with you, but with each other, typically. Right? So the selfish interest of process. Now this is sales. So I'll skip over that or I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that. Right? But um, you know, what are your customers' needs and wants and fill them? Okay, fine. But the key message in my uh, session is that it's the exact same mindset for your partners, for the analysts and press, and for your customers after the sale. Not to sell more, but to get them to support you with references and case studies and things like that. Okay. So, I'm going to follow the formula, hopefully some good generic advice with some specific uh, examples of that. So for partners, partners are people too. For the most part, all your partners are bigger than you. Okay, so the first thing you have to realize is while you see the, the, the broader mission of your company, and hopefully all of your employees, you don't have a lot of them, share in that level of urgency and, and vision and passion, right? Well, Larger companies, that is not the case at all. So the people you're talking to have individual roles with personal objectives and are measured on that on those parochial uh, tasks. Often don't care about the greater good of the company they work for. Don't care is maybe too strong a word, but it is not what motivates them in the decisions they make. Right? Their management has told them things they must accomplish. That is what they're focused on. If, in fact, you come to them with a message that is in the greater good of their company and not aligned with those objectives that they have, you're wasting your time. Okay? Planning. We're little. We're quick. We're agile. We step on a dime. We turn. We go. But larger companies don't do that. You need to understand their timelines. How far in advance do they have to make decisions before they can act on them? You come to somebody with a great idea of how they can do something awesome for next month's conference, exhibition, campaign, whatever. Well, if they planned that thing six months ago, it's done. And all you're doing is annoying them, even if you're right. If you're wrong, they don't care if you're right. All you're doing is just pointing out the flaw that somebody else might discover that it's too late for them to correct. And they're going to actually go out of their way probably to marginalize you and push you away, unless you tell their boss what they could have done. Right? Um, so agility, ability to change, strategy versus execution. People often, I don't know if they're lying, but <coughs> maybe deluding themselves, but very often people who are, who are tasked to do things have nothing to do with deciding that those things should be done. But when you ask them, what do you, what's your role? They'll say, well, I'm responsible for rollout. I'm responsible for a partner relationship. But in fact, they're responsible for doing it. And as you're pitching the value of this collaborative relationship, you're talking to the wrong person. They have no influence. They're not going to tell. Like, you know, like in sales, people lie to you all the time about their authority. Right? So you need to figure that out. And then funding. Right? Just because companies have lots of money on the books doesn't mean the person or the group or the task that you're trying to integrate <coughs> with has any money whatsoever. You need to understand how they get the money, if they get the money. You know, that's totally separate, again, just like sales, but tied to partner spend. If you want them to spend their money on you, you better figure out who spent that money. Right? Um, larger organizations have even larger problems to solve. So, you know, an example I'm going to give for partner for us is, is Microsoft on the next slide. Because Microsoft is no wealthier company on the planet. Okay? But that doesn't mean the group we're talking to has any money whatsoever. Right? And people say, well, oh, Microsoft, they can do anything. Yes, they can do anything, but they can't do everything. Right? So part of our strategy with working with Microsoft is understanding what they wish they could do that they're not doing. For any of these reasons, they don't have the time to respond. They don't have the budget in the appropriate group. They, you know, it didn't, you know, it didn't reach the hundred million dollar threshold, you know, where they can even consider, you know, whatever it is. Figure it out and solve it, right? So we have a very, so part of the task is not to talk about things that can't be repeated. We're, we're empirically unique. We're the only supplier to this thing called Visual Studio, which is like the, 
where everybody who builds anything on Microsoft, they have to live inside this, this thing, right? So we're the only piece of that not written by Microsoft. So awesome, great, who cares? Can't help it, right? But what's interesting is they get that, which is huge value to us in a variety of ways. That group has no money, right? We're the only one. So do you think when they're doing budget, somebody says, oh yeah, where's the money to pay for the thing that you only do once and we'll never do it again? No, there's no money. So we have to get very creative in how we work out that particular aspect. But, but then, of course, they want everybody to work on that platform. So there's a whole partner program built around that that they have. Well, those people, not only do they have, they do have money, but in fact, our unique relationship is a total turnoff to them. And, and, and uh, this is examples of why you need to get to know the roles, right? The people who care about the partners, they want to show partners that are being successful so they can attract other partners. The fact that I can stand up and say, hey, we do something that no one else does, and nobody else could ever do, that just takes them right off the stage. They don't ever want to talk about it, right? So understanding that is, is really important, and understanding their specific technical and objective change to give you the high potential ISV and other programs. Are, these are five different programs, right? I'm totally different programs with different people, right? This is a ch the ISV thing is for sales, it's channel, right? So these people, they're counting something totally different. The revenue of theirs that we influence. Right? And that changes based on say July to July. That's their fiscal year. So again, just the little details you need to understand. Working with the field, they're like any field, they don't trust their own people, let alone anybody else. You know, you gotta you gotta have a win before they give you a chance to have a win, right? And for any large company, a lot of this is about being at the right place at the right time. One of the biggest things that we struggle with, I think we've done pretty well is that not to try to get terms in a contract or in writing or formally. As soon as you do that, they have to get conservative. They have to avoid risk, right? If you get relaxed and you have a good relationship, at that last minute when they're short, a speaker, a story, you know, a partner, a technology demo, whatever, right, for us in those cases, but, and we're just there and ready and willing, we get access revenue, exposure, publicity, that if we had asked for, they would have said no. Okay? But because we, you know, low friction, you know, we get huge benefits that we could never have with other people. So that's analysts and press, okay, they're people too. Right? I'll try to speed this up. Analysts and press are people too. So what's their thing? Well publish or perish. Right? They don't care about sales necessarily. What are their editorial calendars? What do they prefer to cover? Figure this out. What is their beat and what is not? This is very important. What is not? Okay? Because if you take them into a space where they, you, you're asking them to compete with somebody else in their team, whether it's an analyst, I don't cover business, you know, I don't cover this, I cover that, right? Or a reporter, you know, they're going to run away from you. It doesn't matter how big your story is. So, you know, do, you know, do yourself a favor. Read. If you don't know what they've written, you don't know what they're about, don't waste their time. Yeah, again, just like Sam, you wouldn't take a pitch to a prospect that you hadn't qualified at some level. Read their, nothing's easy, they publish their stuff, right? So, again, what can you do for them right now? Okay. Examples? Again, I'm running out of time, so, uh, yeah, sorry? Um, uh, analysts, more than press, um, they have to control the language. Now, there's some good reasons for controlling the language, which is if you communicate large, complicated, sophisticated ideas and concepts over long periods of time, you need to nail that stuff down. But candidly, it also locks you in. Right? Once you control the language, once you control, set the table, all the other analyst stuff makes no sense. Right? Just as a thing to my you know, about like the, you know, the top. You know, Darn has something called the magic quadrant, right? The Forrester, another analyst group call, call, calls it the Forrester wave. You know, it's all the same stuff, different terms, can't translate it. So one, one thing that did impress me to be in the top 100 of actuaries, you know, those people get together and calculate the top 100, that's a model that I'd love to understand. That, that's meaningful versus <laughs> top 100 of, you know, people who don't, don't know how to calculate it. Um, so understand their metrics, understand how they do it, and also understand how analysts, analysts in particular, are measured differently, not just how they publish. Gartner, for example, if you do an inquiry, 
And if you ask a question and you want a certain analyst to answer it, they get a little tick for it. It's a reward for that. So you just, you know, if there's an analyst you want to, you know, you want to love you, schedule inquiries. You're helping them. Right? It's a very simple thing. But I mean, it, those kinds of things. Um, and then the best, best thing in the world. People often at the beginning, I think, relatively naively, want to be credited when analysts write about stuff. <laughs> You know, oh, I talked to this company and they're doing this great thing. Nothing is better than when an analyst takes your ideas, the basic value, like here's a huge problem that must be felt, you know, here's the right approach to addressing this you know, urgent issue, and they take exactly your story, your worldview, and make it their own. Nothing could be better. They just point at it. It's like, Look, it's not me, it's them. <laughs> right? So, so encourage, and again, can't today take this, but I all the time, right up full things that don't refer to our company at all. Send them off to the analyst quietly, hoping. And I have seen it occasionally get success with it. Cut and paste, they put it right in. And it's like, you're a genius, you know, you're doing, you did two years ago exactly what they said should be done. Right? Well, no, they just cut and paste, you know. It's okay. Um, <coughs> and with, you know, press saying things that they're really under economic struggles. So don't think for a second to anybody in the press. It was really about it their job, if not this year, in the next two or three years. Okay, that is an overwhelming thing. What am I going to do with the rest of my life? Okay, so, um, so I'll get someone thing, I'll, I'll slow down, but, but they care about personal branding as a result. Just keep that in mind. Anything they can do, yes, they want their, their own, uh, their publication, their book, whatever, to do well, of course, but privately, they also want to build that personal brand, much more so than almost anybody else. Um, that's just an excerpt from email I got. Last week, from somebody who was talking to the English, he wrote, you know, I got him for him giving us some coverage. He said, Don't thank me. If he didn't give me these things, they would fly right under my radar. You know, so he's writing about stuff like he's this great guy, trolling the technology. He writes, you know, it's like, you know, coincidence it reinforces entirely, but I'm hoping um, the mainstream idea. Customers, guess what? They're people too. It's okay. Um, and, and this is really important, and, and I think most small companies miss this because we're so compressed. We all wear so many hats. Is what I mean by that. Um, is it the person in your in your customer? Their customer. Anybody here sell to other businesses? Okay, this if you sell to consumers, this doesn't quite make any sense. But if you do sell to other businesses, most businesses again are going to be bigger than you, right? So the person who owns the brand, the reputation, who cares about press coverage, customer relations, depending on what you sell, on if you sell marketing and stuff, then this is wrong. But I mean, other than that, this is not your customer, right? And this is the person that's going to say yes or no to whether they get to give you a quote or a case study. Okay, so you need to understand what they care about, okay? So I treat customer case studies and references as an entirely distinct and separate sales cycle. I have a pipeline. You look for the suspects, the prospects. You qualify them as their interest. You do timelines. You forecast likelihood. And you figure out what their needs are, what it's going to take. And it's always a different set of people inside the same organization. The marketing people, the PR you know, people in these large, especially large companies, have a totally different agenda and could care less how you save your champion. Job. They just don't care. It's not, their, you know, it's not their job. You need to understand it and, and work those. So also, when you, of course, you need your champion to go say, this is real, it's true, I want to do it. So understand what you're asking of them when you do that. Okay? Depending on the company, what's the internal risk when they raise their hand and say, I'd like you, you know, hey, I was totally screwing up. And this company came in and saved my tail. If it wasn't for me, boy, would this company you know, not likely this person is going to be your internal champion as it relates to a case study, mm -hmm. right? Um, so what's the approval process? You're talking about a publicly traded company, a highly regulated uh, environment perhaps. That approval process is up there, right? Opportunity cost for that individual. So if it's a long, detailed process, there's an opportunity cost for that individual. We could be doing other things to further their own career, right? So, you know, understand that. Um, and has it ever been done? Before I ask for a case study, I do a search to see if they've ever given quotes or case studies to other suppliers in my industry or not. If they never have, you know, it's a lower likelihood that they're ever done it. Right? It doesn't matter how great I am. 
right? Um, and what do your new buyers need? Buyers mean the PR people. Can you help amplify the office with their PR objectives? That's not too hard to find out. Okay, go to their annual, the public, look at their annual report, certainly go to the website no matter what. Pretty much they tell you what they're about or what they care about. Right? So in that example, here's just one. West, I don't know what they're, they're a public company, they're about uh, six, seven hundred million a year. So they're a pretty big company. Um, this is the part I would quote or point to if you were talking about our press release, right? They upped the ante, they did this great thing, they picked us. You know, and you've got a great quote from the tech guy of theirs, and you know, we're just the leader, you know, awesome. But how did I get the PR people and the market people to approve that quote? Okay, who could care less about any of this? Well, it's actually wrapped up around this. So if you actually look at the full press release, I guess I could have used the laser pointer. The, the first sentence of that quote, right, is that I state their goal, right? Providing the highest levels of security in the process of continuous assessments and that's their message on their site already. In the end, it's West End Home Solution keeps pace with rapidly chasing threats and regulatory obligations. It's all about, you know, that. So you oh, I like this end of that. I like this end of that. This is this little supporting clause, you know, whatever, check. Well, that's the thing I just showed you in the previous slide, right? Which I'll take that. And then I also threw in a quote from our CEO, which they can take and use anytime they want, which just says clearly, West is brilliant. Company, they do these awesome things. It doesn't, you know, and so they can pull that out and point to that on our website or it gets picked up in other press, and their PR people say, look, look at the positive press for them. So that's why they approved it. Okay. I, I deliberately went and took their message and used their endorsement of us as just a little supporting one more anecdote as to why they are who they say they are. My experience, if you don't do that, you just lose your likelihood of getting, you know, high level, visible companies uh, to get on. So, uh, I guess the, the conclusion of the, the Tai Chi concept is if you map out your goals, understand the goals of your, the rest of the world around you, partners, customers, suppliers, famous and press. Make some of their goals your goals. And if you're successful, some of your goals will become their goals. And that's where you get the multiplier. Because when they take a little bit of your stuff, uh, because they're bigger, because they have the reach, because they have the entropy and momentum, uh, you get that multiplier. Thank you. Oh, no questions till the end. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I have a question. So, um, Sebastian, I'm looking at your slides and I'm thinking, wow, so. They're not as nice as her. No, sorry. That's what <laughs> I was thinking, wow, so getting to know all the beats of all the reporters and what all the analysts cover and then developing relationships with them so I understand their perspective so I can pitch ourselves within their perspective, that's so time consuming. What has been your experience in, you know, how much of that research and background can you do from sources that are readily available? like their website, like the internet, how much of that can you pull from there versus how much of it are you doing through live phone conversations or even live meetings? Um, with the exception of analysts where they often um, control their content for a fee um, and some partner stuff we're talking about future campaigns where they obviously consider it to be uh, confidential. 100% is doable through online sources. And, uh, and you don't need to have the depth. The key to, for me anyway, is that uh, you don't need to have the depth of understanding about what they write uh, or produce that you have about your own stuff. Um, you have just enough to acknowledge that you've taken the time <laughs> to read their stuff, and even if you have a slightly incorrect um, or incomplete view, that's okay. That's an opportunity for them to say, oh, no, 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 that's not what I meant. They tell you, and another one of my many sayings I've over and over is, the more you listen, the smarter you sound, right? So if you can get them talking about something they think is really important, and they're just listening, their, their emotional memory of that conversation will be so. It, get it, you know, but really all of us is 
they had a great experience talking about this stuff, right? And if in the end, and, and one of them, the bullets in there, you know, slides is, is pick your battles, right? So, so when they're in that open emotional state, is when you say, that is brilliant. And, and, and the one thing I would say is, how does that fit into that? That's a good point, you know, and they write it down, and now it's a part of their narrative, you know. If you said, I'd like you to change your mind and write about this, forget it. But if, if, it's, if they perceive it as reinforcing, you can't be able to do their agenda, it, it's great. So I think you can do it very, very quickly, but, but picking your battles, and <coughs> knowing that thing, there is, I guess, some skill or, or through repetition that you develop, you know, like that, you can fix quickly, this is important, flop, etc. Um, so just to follow up on that question, so let's say we've done, we've done our research, we've identified, you know, the analysts, the publications, all these people in our area. How do you then suggest we reach out to them? Right? Do we pick up the phone? Do we start sending emails? Do we produce content and send it to them? I mean, how do we how do we engage these people? Because that is potentially a very time-consuming, you know, activity as well. Because they'll spend some time talking to you, but nothing may come out of it. So how do how do you vet that out, especially if you don't have a lot of dollars to spend? So, repeating the question as instructed, how do you connect to those people that, that you want to speak with? Um, and, and, you know, I draw an analogy, and, and I do that for shorthand, but also you can tap internally on expertise you may already have. It's exactly like selling, right? You're already doing this. You might identify the list of likely prospects, how you're going to reach them, right? And the same portfolio of tactics will work. So, in other words, do you know somebody in common? You know something about them that's unique enough that when you reach out to them, however you choose to, you'll catch their attention? Is there something, I mean, just look at how your salespeople are finding ways to, to connect to them, find the right people and connect, and transport. That's the first thing I would say. Um, the second, in terms of the list that you just iterated over, sending them content would be the very bottom. I would just say. But uh, you need a personal connection first to get their attention. Um, you know, I could send you a cure for cancer, but if you never open it up, you know, we're all going to get sick. So, so you, you know, it's about event prioritizing. And again, take advantage of the sales mentality, which is, you know, how do I address whatever nightmare they had last night? Help them, suggest to them I might have a way to help them sleep better tonight. Earn the right to come in and look for that. So, uh, so treat it like a lead. You know, definitely, definitely. Other questions at this point? Okay, thank you, Sebastian. Sure, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll turn over to Laura now. Laura's got her. I do. I'm just going to borrow your. There we go. So, Laura Bennett, Embrace Pet Insurance. We tell pet health insurance <coughs> the unexpected vet bills in your lives. How many people here actually have pets? How many people know people who have had, you know, bad experiences with going to the vet um, and the cost of that? So you might understand, yes, there's a few people here waving. I'll try not to walk too much in front of this. So I will come on this way. Um, we, I started, I got involved with pet insurance, not by plan, of course, who would ever think <laughs> to join pet insurance, but I uh, started, I went to do my MBA to get out of insurance. I've been in insurance for many years, and I thought this is not how I want to progress, progress my career, running a large life and health insurance company. And so I went to Wharton, thought I would get an MBA to pretend that I don't have and my CFA and my MBA, you know, my, uh, my actuarial stuff, it all looks rather geeky on paper, so I thought I'd get a, the nice MBA to persuade people that I could actually work in their company and maybe run it one day. And a friend of mine, Pet, got sick, her cat. And she spent $5,000 on the cat. This is at the University of Pennsylvania's veterinary hospital, very expensive. And she thought, well, we, we should have had pet insurance because uh, she's British. And in the United Kingdom, pet insurance is a lot more common over there than it is here. And so we thought, um, she thought, well, maybe you should, you know, look into it. We looked into it, saw it, it was very poorly done. So we're talking 2001. Very poorly done and uh, was, thought, maybe there's a business idea here. She didn't have any experience in insurance. So cut a long story short, four of us put together a business plan for 
um, pet insurance while we were at Morton. So my whole second year at Morton was um, uh, spent using pet insurance as an example in every single class. I went to, <laughs> people were sick and tired of hearing about it. So, uh, so we, uh, I don't know if I can, is this actually, uh, oh, there we go. Yeah. So we won the business plan competition. How bizarre, a pet insurance company beating out all the tech and biotech companies at the time. But when we were putting the plan together, I realized that this was an enormous opportunity for me to use the knowledge that I had in the past to, to apply to something new and unique, which is pet insurance. Because it's, believe it or not, not one of those things you learn when you become an actuary. You don't learn about pets, they're never mentioned. In fact, it's a bit like saying, you know, basket weaving course at college, you know, it's a pet, it's sort of a laugh, a laugh factor. Um, but it's actually a very complicated, complicated thing. And, uh, but I really enjoyed doing it, so I thought this is something I'd like to do. So, uh, we founded um, Embrace um, in 2003, and so when I say we, Alex and myself, so he was part of that team. And we put together the, the tables, we spoke to Lloyds of London, who we explained to try to we have to have an insurance partner, so we found them. And uh, but we still needed to land the, uh, to to get um, to get that insurance partner to have credibility. But we managed to get this is one of the most important things that happened to us uh, was uh, Jumpstart investing in uh, in race. We wouldn't be here today without without Jumpstart. But that gave us the credibility to meet with Lloyd, um, so we were able to show them that uh, we could actually, we were more than two people with the business plan. In fact, we met upstairs, hosted them, Lloyd's here, and uh, managed to get Lloyd's. So I started writing a blog on pet insurance because my intent was to write a blog about pet insurance, uh, to become an expert, to, to, to do that, and I thought, well, I needed to be selling pet insurance to have that expertise. But it took so long, you know, to start to see, at like, the time, we're talking, 03 to 04 and then eventually 06 is when we actually sold our first policy. I thought, why wait to tell, to tell people about pet insurance? Because I knew a lot about pet insurance by this time. And uh, so I started the blog. And that's literally five years ago today, we started the blog. So we just had our anniversary. We finally signed the agreement. We haven't even signed the agreement. But all the time I'm writing about pet insurance, what's out there, critiquing it, not being mean or nasty about other people, but just sort of pointing out what people needed to know in order to build a name for Embrace and us as experts in pet insurance. Having being an actuary helps, you know, gives, you know, even though no one really knows that no one knows anything about pet insurance, that's an actuary, but that's okay. Um, and um, so we sell our first policy. Um, we launched our website, e-commerce website, six months later. So between here and here, we were doing phone sales. And we didn't have a website up, we just had a placeholder website. It just said, go to the blog to learn more about pet insurance, because that was the only place I could really control information about our pet insurance, until we got our e-commerce site up. And so we actually sold a few policies based on people who said, oh, I've been reading your blog, and I want to buy your pet insurance. That was great. It took, you know, 2007, we reached 1,000 pets insured. Um, we received, a, just over a year ago, year and a half ago, we got a first round of venture funding, and we've now got a second, second round of funding. We reached the 5,000 pets in 2009, and we're about to do our 10,000th pet, which uh, it's, well, having come from nothing to 10,000 pets, it's, uh, it's been quite, quite the, uh, the challenge. We first thought that we would sell pet insurance through the internet and word of mouth because we're so brilliant, you know, that everybody would start talking about our product and everyone would believe what they heard and soon we would have thousands and thousands of pets insured. Of course, we all know that that doesn't work that way. Uh, we started off on the internet, on the internet using social media and, um, and whoops, got that here. And we said, we're not going to go for veterinarians because they don't care about pet insurance. Because pet insurance has been done very poorly in the past in the US. And that's why it's not really done, done so well. So when we, uh, and in the future we're looking, and this is now as we 
we've gone through, we are actually talking to veterinarians now because they came to us and said, we'd like a brochure. And we're like, brochures? <laughs> brochures. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we've got some brochures done and Dog goes out to the vets. And, and actually now that is our most important channel. And we could talk about a little bit about that. But in the future, breeders and HR and strategic partners are all future paths that we're taking. We're not going to get too much into those. So we're going to kind of focus on the, the direct because direct to the customer, is one thing, veterinarians, totally different people. To they're, they're like businesses, they're influencers of our customers. They don't want us, they don't want to buy pet insurance, they even don't want to talk about it. They just, we have to connect with them so that they tell their customers to get pet insurance. So the two, two channels here, you can think of the direct, uh, women between the ages of 25 to maybe 55 who are married but have no children. The children are their pets. Uh, they are educated and have a reasonable household income. They're not exceptionally wealthy, but they have some money. Veterinarians are old school, generally. It's changing. Uh, new veterinarians now are almost 95% women, but have been uh, men mostly in the past. And so uh, they like paper, they like faxes, and they like to trust other vets. They don't trust anyone else. At least of all, actually. <laughs> So direct to pet parent, how are we going to deal with that? Most of our um, people are fairly savvy. So um, the, we started off with the blog. We uh, have, I have a LinkedIn profile, built a profile for Embrace on there. We reached out to people, just pet people, just you know, people in the pet business thought more just to get our name out there. The website we first had was word of mouth, but then we went to the e-commerce site. Uh, we do push word of mouth, so uh, social media stuff that I do is a lot of word of mouth, but we do encourage our customers to talk about us. We actually don't need to encourage them, they do talk about us. We're very focused on customer service and being very personal with our customers, because for them this is an emotional product, so we have to be emotional with them. And uh, so they relate to that and they love the service that we give them. I'm on Twitter all the time. Uh, find a phone and I can tweet on, so uh, what I tweet is the CEO of this company and the co-founder, but also as a human being, a mother with kittens and cats and, and, and that kind of thing. So I'm connecting with our customers as a person. I think that's very important. Even if you don't market, if your business is marketing to uh, businesses, you're talking to people. You're talking to people in those businesses, you're not talking to a business person. So, um, Facebook, we do a lot with Facebook as well. So, I'm just going to very briefly, let me check the time here. So, what do we do? Okay, do we have time? Okay. All right, so uh, I want to talk specifically a bit about blogging. Um, what I would suggest, if you want to get started, don't blog. Read other people's blogs. Read and comment and get a feel for how blogging works. It's not like anything else you've ever done. So, it's... Uh, Chunk size ideas. Don't, don't go any more than that. So just start reading and commenting and building something. Then start writing um, about blogs, but don't tell anyone. Okay? Just get into the rhythm of it and write for maybe a month or two before you tell anyone that you've been writing a blog. Um, and but pick your topics and your and how you're how you're going to do it. So you want to define your purpose up front. Why are you blogging? What is the pur purpose of what you're trying to do? And then stick to it. Don't go writing about your your children if you're trying to provide a professional expertise on a um, special type of glass. Unless you think that that's part of your connection is to be personal about the special type of glass that you're blogging about. Um, you know, have a, a calendar of what you're going to talk about so you keep on a routine and a rhythm. Um, and so in our case, we were trying to build the trust in the Embrace brand and, and so on, I won't go through it. But, but this is really very specific about what we choose to do with the blog. So this is what the blog looks like today. It did look like this. So, you know, it looks very nice, very simple. This is actually TypePad, and uh, these are the tools that I would suggest. I use TypePad, by the way, because Seth Godin used TypePad. If anyone knows blogging and, and marketing people, Seth Godin used it, and I figured if Seth Godin could use it, then it was good enough for me. So, uh, so Six Apart is company uh, TypePad is one of their products. Movable Type is a more comprehensive, bigger kind of product, more customizable and so on. Um, but WordPress is actually what I would recommend. 
uh, blogger, I wouldn't recommend. It's a very basic tool, but you can't integrate it with your website. Because the point of your part of your blogging is to connect to your website so you get more links, leads, and SEO juice. You know, so Google juice. You want your blog to be attached to your to your website. So I, while I used, oops, type pad. I wish that I used WordPress, but it, you have to be a bit more geeky to do that. Sorry, go ahead. Cost. Cost. Typepad is about six dollars a month, okay. and WordPress is free. It's uh, open source. Yeah. Other than the technical SEO juice stuff, the, the the groundswell of word of mouth. Do you use the blog to promote? Like, what what was the catalyst to start people? Or do you do that, or do your customers just start talking about you? And they're you're really it's luck. Or it's, what do you do to get that groundswell? Well, you, you want to talk about things that people want to to learn about. So I don't just talk about pet insurance, I talk about pet health in general. I'm trying to get people educated about pet insurance in general. So I try not to be forceful about Embrace and what we do, but I will bring that up. It's a side laughing. Um, on a blog, you want people to interact. So you want to have things they want to talk about. And there's one, there's a couple of posts on my blog that have over 200 comments each. Mm -hmm. And you just keep building and building and building because it's something people feel very passionate about. So does that answer your question? So you think the blog is the is the, the one tool that really creates that interaction? Because you could post stuff on Facebook and whether somebody yeah. looks at it or not. I mean, I mean, obviously there's a lot of places for comments, but you think the blog, do you feel the blog is the best interactive tool? It, it's, I would say it's the best. I think it's one way. And that's the one thing about social media, that people like to, people go into it in different ways. So I talk about Facebook. We do do Facebook. We do Twitter. Um, you know, LinkedIn, all of these. So some people will come at it in a different way. So it's just it's just one way that people that people find us and talk to us. Um, and I've got a whole other topic on, on how we would structure our website to be much more like a blog overall and to have community around our website, which I think that's the kind of web 3.0 where we're going with our with our website. But uh, Facebook's very interactive too if people like to use it. So it just depends. So quickly, TypePad dashboard, I just want to show, it's very simple, it's very straightforward, the, uh, I have a blog here, but I also have another, we use another one internally, so we have a blog for our own internal people, so they can see it, you know, we just post stuff instead of emailing around. Um, and just quickly here, this is the structure of the web, my site that you just saw, but in very simple form, and I can just drag and drop these pieces and rearrange what, how my blog looks, so it's very simple and straightforward. Twitter, I'm going to move a bit faster, but again, it's the look and feel. This is the Embrace look and feel. There's Kate, who's sitting at the back right there, and Kate writes for the Embrace. She tweets for the Embrace, um, but we're very open about, about who's tweeting, um, and uh, you know, this is representing Embrace. I have one, looking very similar, but this is me. So I tweet about me and all the things that and it happens to also talk about Embrace, but these are the people I'm, I'm following. So if you're familiar with Twitter, just little conversations that I have with people. Uh, Facebook as well, very interactive. It allows us to provide uh, just, just more interactions and have people post their own photos and things like that. So we, we love that. Uh, website, and I'm just gonna, you know what, I'm gonna move along here. Where veterinary, it's a totally different conversation. You have to talk to people how they want to talk to you. You can't just talk to them in the way that they, that, that you want, you know. So we want to talk to a vet using the internet and technology, and they don't want any of that. So it's all phone and fax. I mean, we've become the best faxes in the world. Um, and uh, webinars and, and trying to do face-to-face -face as best we can and brochures and stuff. So uh, just very briefly, we have boxes we send out. So here's Daisy the Beagle, and here's our brochures that we had to invent because Bears asked for it. But one thing that we found that's been incredibly successful over the last couple of months, accidentally discovered, one of our policy holders asked us, do you have any spare suture material, or know of anyone that does? Because I have a tsunami uh, uh, charity in Sri Lanka, and we send them suture material for their, for their charity. Do you, could you help me find some? And I'm like, hmm, I think I know a few veterinarians. So I sent, sent out some information, and when we connect with veterinarians now, we ask, do you have a spare stuff? Well, my goodness, now suddenly they care about us so much more, because we're asking, we're furthering a cause
tools that they care about, doing something with materials that they would just throw away that are benefiting other people. And we get boxes and boxes of suture material because we talk to thousands of vets literally um, all the time. So this has been a great way for vets suddenly now to care, you know, to, for us to, to walk down a path together doing something that they care about. So in this case, what we're trying, you know, we're connecting with them in a way that, um, you know, that they feel is not threatening or trying to force something down their throat. Uh, so just very briefly, the, what we've learned sort of really is to create this spark, to create something that people care about, that was worth talking about, so which would be our customer service and our product. You've got to have basic something, like you've got to have a platform to base the word of mouth and everything else on. You need to communicate with people in the way that they want to be communicated about. And then, you know, you need to focus. Now we pick veterinarians and internet. We'd love to do breeders and HR channel and strategic partners and all that. And we're dabbling in those in a teensy weensy way, but, but we're focusing on the two to be really successful and that's how we got to 10,000 pets insured. Down the road, as we build our own resources and ability, we will uh, you know, move to these other channels. But having focus is so tempting to run off and do these other things, but having the focus has helped us be successful. And then I was wondering what this word was. I was like, what is that word? Oh, re-aim, okay? Uh, so, so you, you know, you watch and you listen and you react and then you keep going and you tweak what you're doing and you <coughs> keep, keep working on it to get the best maximum effort. So you use the inf information you're receiving in, the energy you're receiving in, and feed it back out and give it back in waves. And of course, celebrate. Often, which as an entrepreneur, we actually don't do very much. We're like, yay, okay, next thing. <laughs> um, or, oh, yeah, but that's the well, this stuff is broken, so we need to celebrate. Um, how do you do um, SEO to promote some of these some of these sites, tools, things you develop? Uh, well, we it's so first of all, we don't we haven't paid anything to anyone for. Uh, we don't, we don't do internet marketing as such. So all of the links and stuff that we get, we, we have to work on. So there's link building and then there's actual sort of content. So we very focused on the content and as, I think, well educate ourselves as to what is effective. So we're probably 80% of the way there and we're just now hiring. We're just in a position where we can hire experts to take us the next level up. How did you do the research to figure out what was effective, what you needed to do to be at the top of the list? Um, so I read blogs, <laughs> and, and so there's a ton of blogs that you can read on those topics, but also just, it's just reading and looking at good examples, um, and every now and then we get a free consult from somebody and ask, ask them, and you know, they might give us one little tidbit that we didn't know about, so it's just picking up tidbits, but SEO in particular it changes every minute. So you have to just keep keep reading and keep up on it, and just it has to be a personal hobby, really. Um, how, how often do you tweet, and how many other people in your company tweet as well? Um, I don't know about personally how many tweets, because I don't. Well, like how, how but, often, like in a day? Oh, I tweet, you know, uh, maybe sort of every uh, um, every hour. I just throw something up there, or um, you know, respond to someone. A lot of times I'll respond to someone. So just as some interaction. Reaching out, it, there's a whole technique to it, but it doesn't. It's 140 characters, so it doesn't take much. Just throw it in the side. Okay. Um, you have something called a net promoter score, I think. Can you just talk a little bit about that? And have, has it been helpful to you, or yeah. what? So no, word of mouth. Um, one of the difficult ways of, it's difficult to measure word of mouth. Um, because even if people tell you that they told someone else about you, you don't even know if they sign up or how they, what, what happens. So a net promoter score, this might be something that people have heard of. It's a measure of basically how willing are your customers to recommend you to other people. So we do a survey once a year. We'd love to do it more often at the moment. We can only do it once a year. And we ask people as one of the questions, uh, you know, what would you recommend us? to other people, and it's on a score from 1 to 10, and so the 9s and the 10s are kind of where you want, want it to be um, up there, and you kind of work out the score, you sort of detract those that are below 5 and those that are above 5 and net them off, um, and anything, you know, most, I think large corporations like cell phone companies are at like, well if they're positive, I think they're lucky, um, <laughs> um, so, so we're at the moment at 50% score, we like to be up 
even further. That was last year. I'm actually curious to see where we are this year. But um, yeah. I have one quick follow-up question on the net promoter. Um, how many pet insurance companies are there, and where are you in rank on customer satisfaction? So there are about there are actually eleven cust uh, pet insurance companies. One is literally brand new, so I'd say ten. And uh, in terms of customer satisfaction, there's the way we tell, apart from hearing lovely things from our customers, there's a, com uh, a website called PetInsuranceReview.com. So review sites very very important to keep an eye on what's going on. Do not do not underestimate. Them. Um, and we're in, you know, in the top two companies, only two above nine out of ten. And we actually ask every single customer who gets a claims decision, that means if they didn't get paid something or they did get paid something, to go and review us on that site. So we have a full honest view of our own customer service. And you have to assume that the people who are complaining are still going to complain. The people who are happy may or may not go and, go and write it, but we get great, great reviews and great feedback. What percentage of your the time that your company spends is in the blogs? Uh, well, I write the blog. So it takes me about anywhere from half an hour to 45 minutes to write an entry, a decent entry. Sometimes I'll actually just throw something up quickly, but uh, uh, it takes me a, a fair while, and I do it uh, maybe three times a week. So. That's as much time as gets spent on the blog. And what part of your marketing effort is that? What part of the marketing yes. effort? Um, well, it's just a peripheral, one of the many marketing things things that we do. It's something that uh, uh, it adds to people's research when they're researching pet insurance, coming to the blog and, and learning about us. So it is part of the um, uh, educational aspect of our marketing. Right. 10%, 20, 50? Oh, it's 0.1%. It's like it's 45 minutes of my time three times a week. So, you know, we have two people who do marketing full time. So I'm not even in the marketing department. I'm the <laughs> chief geek. <laughs> so, um, and, uh, it seems like there might be a few more questions if you have any more questions. I, I can say afterwards, absolutely. Thank you yeah. very much. So, thanks, Laura. <laughs>
This is how we did. Take a look. This is how we did. See this down here at the very, very bottom where the, the dots are really small? That's where I got on board. So um, that's where I took over with the, where, the, uh, where we just got started with the organization. Um, we, I, she, as Kathy said, I drive over to school under $5 million. We're now at 110 million. Uh, and this is my second startup. I, I, uh, the company Spirit Rent a Car, which is a local uh, Ohio firm, we sold to Wayne and Senga in 97. So I've been where you guys all are twice. Uh, both times with successful exits. So I, I know exactly, that's really, I'm much more comfortable dealing in that environment. So this is going to be geared to, you know, at least from my perspective, when you're kind of getting going and your resources are limited. Um, marketing tips, mine again, are much more simplistic. Uh, my goal has always been to get my name and number in front of the customer at the point of purchase. Simple as that. Um, I think segmentation is critical. In both cases, uh, I dealt with a group, the first case I group, I dealt with a, uh, my target customer was an insurance adjuster or a body shop manager. Uh, my second one was a clinical engineer in a hospital. Um, so I, I looked for, for stuff that would get my name in front of them when they were buying. Um, it's pretty simplistic. I, I, it, it, I believe frequency beats wow every time. Um, probably you have in your line of work with the people who want to sell you stuff want to sell you wow. Because, quite honestly, that's what the commissions are made. They'll make a lot of money selling cheap pens. Uh, but your customer, who won't really make a lot of segmentation, but uh, make a lot of care, will look at it the same way. If when they're making the purchase, they look at it and go, oh, that's the company I want to deal with. Um, I use the example, you want to think about national ad campaigns. You know, McDonald's runs six trillion ads of 10 seconds each versus one for a half hour. So when you're looking to spend your marketing dollars, I believe personally that you want to spend them with a lot of frequency at this point in your development, because the one thing you need more than anything is brand. You need people to know who you are and what you do when it's time to make a purchase. Um, I don't care if you're a B2B or a B2C, that's the key thing in marketing. Um, loyalty campaigns, especially early on, I think are a real good idea. They don't cost you a lot of money and they incentivize future buying behavior. Loyalty campaign can be something as simple as offering a future discount. Uh, on any kind of a purchase. Um, it doesn't have to be terribly expensive. It doesn't have to cost you a lot of money. The very act that you're willing to do it, in many cases, offers you, offers you a little bit different segmentation than, your, than whoever you might be competing with. So I would encourage those. I, I think personally have a little bit success with um, Creating brand, uh, the big thing here is being consistent. How many people here are the only ones in their organization that touch customers? Two? Everybody else has employees or associates? Well, let me assure you, you would be horrified and faint if you knew how your brand was used by some of your associates. I actually had to take an employee about six months ago and told him to send button to those off limits. He couldn't hit send anymore. Because his letters, quite honestly constructed, were so poorly written, he thought they were good, that he, every time he put my company name on it, it was an embarrassment. But I had you know, built a very large organization now of 200 people, you gotta be really careful how people represent you. You think they think the same way you do, and as was said earlier, you think they share the passion you do. Not always. Were you able to develop him into somebody who could send better emails, or did you just say you can't send the emails anymore? Well, after I got done being mad, uh, we actually <laughs> we, we, we helped him actually craft a template and said, here, use this. Um, but in the short run, I said management had to oversee anything he sent. Okay. The problem, see, here's the problem you have with any type of indigenous marketing, where people create their own stuff. How many people here got up this morning, looked in the mirror, and went, that looks horrible, I'm going to work? <laughs> Anybody? Anybody ever? Anybody ever uh, uh, bought a painting for their house and said, that's the most hideous thing in the world, let me hang it up? <laughs> nope. Anybody looked at a set of carpet and gone, wow, that's ugly, let's put it in my house. But yet, how many of us have gone to someone's house, seen other dress, and gone, are you kidding me? Oh my God, what were they thinking? Okay? The problem is that person, when they put it on, thought they looked good. They went in the mirror and went, got it, man. I'm a chick man of the day. Okay? <laughs> Even though everybody else went, like this. So the problem with marketing is your employees will do the same thing. They think it looks good. They think it's well written. They think it's representing you in a positive way. The problem is they're branding you in a way you don't like or want at all. Now, you want to develop top of mind awareness with your customers. You want them to think about you when it's time to make a purchase. Do they know your name? Do they, what do they think about your name? What kind of impression do they get about when they think about you? Um, the, the, the last one is, is an old adage. I'm, I'm sure you guys are probably, most of you have all heard it. Fast, cheap, or good, pick two. That's kind of the, my adage I work with when it comes to marketing and spending my dollars. 
Fast, cheap, or good. Fast, cheap, or good. Pick two. You can't have all three ever. Now, I will freely admit that, that in the marketing world, I am probably somewhat of a dinosaur. I have yet to embrace social media within our company because I've yet to have anybody be able, ever be able to put a dollar figure and explain to me how it translates into sales. I've had a lot of people tell me how it translates into customers feeling better, but I've yet to have anybody tell me how did that translate to a buying decision. So I will admit I am somewhat the old guard here, but I have not invested a lot of time and money in it. I put a lot of money in our web presence. I put a lot of money in, in keywords, I put a lot of money in, in, in links, but as far as social networking, I haven't done any of it. And our organization has not any of it, and I've had a gazillion people pitch me on why we should, but I always ask the question, how do I translate it into dollars? And yet, and yet so what I get whenever I do that, I get marketing people that go, well, your customers are going to feel good. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so just as a, as a point of reference, that's why I guess I part ways with most of the cool marketing guys these days. Um, my, uh, the rest of this presentation, I just want to talk briefly about sales because that's really, you know, that's my, my strength. Um, I think that when you're starting up, this is kind of really the important thing. I, in my resume or my, my introduction, I talked about these two startups I'm with. Uh, Checkpoint Surgical, really cool new technology, medical growth fund, puts money in and they asked me to sit on the board. Uh, and Himalux, which is going to be a new way of looking, quite honestly, you know, revolutionize the way we diagnose skin cancer. Uh, is that it can, instead of using sound waves or um, x-ray, it's using light to be able to diagnose skin. The, the, they've got great technology, they've got great smart people working there. The only thing they don't have is any sales. So I said, I'll help you try to build that if I can. The first thing I do when I'm teaching salespeople how to sell, the very first thing I tell them is whatever you say, whatever you do, you've got to say it in your voice. It's got to sound like you. Uh, a lot of sales trainers try to get people to mimic and imitate with them. That is horrible. Customers see through that in about two and a half seconds. What you're getting now is me. You might go, what the hell is that guy talking about? But in language, it's me. At the end of the presentation, I'll own every bit of it. Um, if I tried to emulate one of the prior speakers, you'd go, that guy sounds weird. That's not him. Well, it's the same way when people are selling. So please make sure either you or the people that represent you, when they're talking about your product, they are talking about it in their voice using their words. Hey, John. Yes. Sorry, so a question on that. So we, we were just talking <coughs> earlier about an example where people <coughs> using their own voice were doing it in a way that wasn't representative of your brand. So Correct. that's kind of the balance there. Well, you have to have boundaries on it. Um, you have to be able, for example, in this case, the individual wrote in very poor fashion. So it, was, it wasn't what he was saying about it, it was how he was saying it. Um, in other cases, you may have people that don't understand what they're selling, and therefore they have to be educated further. But when they explain it, I want them to explain it in terms and in words that work for them. In this case, it was written communication that they struggled with. Um, this is a, I've done this now in two, three times. Uh, to, a door firm up in Michigan, too, that I've helped for a little bit. This is, it, it would be a foundation of a book someday, if I ever retire. Uh, this is what I teach every salesperson. They, they, they have gold little cards with them. Um, I, I walk them through this. We have classes. We have brush ups. I've done you know, seminars on it. I call it the Seven Commandments of Sales. It works inside. <coughs> uh, find your work. Work your plan. Let's be friends. What's important to you? It's our specialty. Ask for the business. Where's that number? And spread the word. And I'm going to take just a second and go through these so you kind of understand the concepts behind these. Because I think every single successful sales call, every one I've done, follows these. Uh, plan your work, work your plan. I won't spend a lot of time on it other than to say that it's one of the oldest adages in sales, and it works. If people don't know what they're saying prior to getting in on the call, they will fail. As I tell our people, you've got to know whether to thank them or spank them. And you have to look at customers' background and history to know whether they're, they're an upward arc, a downward arc, a zero arc. Because if you come in and start talking about a customer in a way that leads them to believe that you have no idea of what their history is, they will turn you off that fast. And again, everything I say here, reference yourself. Think about your own personal experience. If you're dealing with somebody trying to sell you something that clearly doesn't know you or your company, how much attention do they get? Almost none. So you have to learn this. You have to have whatever avenue you have, whatever database you use, whatever resources you've got, Make sure your salespeople understand the customer before they engage in word one. Uh, the analogy I use here is golfing. Um, if, you, if you have one pitch, one presentation, and you just use it over and over and over again, so when I talk to her, I'm using my same pitch, when I talk to him, I use the same pitch, when I talk to him, I use the same pitch, I may or may not hit based on where they are. I have to know the customer. 
In golf, you don't use one club. You use a variety of clubs depending on where you are from the hole. It's the same with sales. She's upset with me. She used to use me and we upset her on, a, on an order. I have a different pitch than someone who's never used me or someone who's used me frequently. You have to have the same. Let's be friends. People buy from people they like. Simple and old adage. People uh, like people who are like them. So I use the term be a chameleon and a lot of times people recoil. It's like, oh, that's a, that's a nasty thing. Not at all. Chameleons don't change being chameleons. They just change color. So what I teach our people is to look for commonality. This is a key word. So you find my thing right there. Commonality. Because once you find something in common with the customer, you, in essence, come around the table. You're on the same side of the table as them because you're like them. So I tell my people, you can talk about anything in the world you want. There are no off-limit bounds. None. Because if the customer wants to engage in a conversation about sex, I don't care. If that's what the customer wants to talk about, my guy's comfortable with it. They want to talk about they want to talk about kids, they want to talk about marriage, they want to talk about travel. I don't care. As long as the customer's comfortable with it, that's fine. The only ground rules I tell you is you can't be offensive and if the um, and you're not going to try to change anyone's opinion. If they're Republican and you're Democrat, great, just agree to disagree and move on. It's not your time to try to get a vote. So, you know, this is, a, this is the, about the only thing I say. The other one is that it can't be fake. I can't pretend to like something. Um, about five years ago, I had two pieces, I had two what I consider must-see TVs, two things I DVR every single week. And they were as polar opposite as you could get. One was The Sopranos, and the other one was American Idol. <laughs> so, I, I mean, you're, you're talking about two really wild ends of the uh, testosterone meter. Um, and, and, you know, but there's true, it's what I watch and what I like. So if somebody brought up a conversation about either one of those programs, I could speak chapter and verse about it. But if I tried to, if someone talked about Lost, I, I was Lost. I never saw it. I was like, oh, no. You'll see people who try to fake that. They go, oh, yeah, I love that show. First question somebody asked, they like a complete idiot. So I always say, it's got to be real. It's got to be something you legitimately have in common. Now, what you can tell people, what you can try them on, is there are some things that are really easy openers. Where are you from? I'll, I'll do it here. Where are you from? Cleveland. Cleveland, born and raised? Yeah. All life? I just moved here about, um, oh gosh, uh, 14 years ago. I grew up in Michigan and lived around the whole country. You ever been to Michigan? Um, yeah, I have. Any family up there? No, no. Oh, you should get some. Yeah. Um, <laughs> see, I, can, I can start a conversation <laughs> about geography and just about anything because I, my, my theory has always been if she's born and raised in Cleveland, what I would have done is I would have expanded on the fact that here she has lived her whole life here. She obviously likes it. Or she'd have moved. Right? She likes it there. That's a good thing. People, if they're in the same area they grew up, presumably like it there. In most cases. Or they would have left and gone somewhere else. I happen to have lived everywhere. I lived in Michigan, Nevada, Utah, California, um, now Ohio. So I mean, I've been all over the place. But I'm looking for an opening where somebody said, well, yeah, I've been to Nevada. Really? You live in Reno? Yeah, I live there. We can talk about things there. Now we have something in common. Um, wives, kids are great. Uh, you know, spouses, kids, anybody that's been married, you got something to complain or brag about. <laughs> and everybody's got it in common. Now all of a sudden you've got something that you've got something you're shoulder to shoulder with your customer with, besides just you're trying to sell a product to them. Um, what's important to you? This is simply asking questions. Um, you said it earlier about, you know, the more, the more you listen, the smarter you get. Asking a question and shutting up. It's harsh, but true. If you ask a customer something, you have to be able to let them tell you what their needs are, and then you better be able to fill it. And you'll never know unless you ask. This segment of any sales calls is responding, what are you looking for? What's important to you? What do you like about your, your, your current supply? What don't you like? Things like that, you can draw them out. Once you know it, it better will be your specialty. It's the one thing you do better than anything else. Another common feeling that salespeople have is they've got the one thing that they really know about their product, and they want to sell that, even though that isn't necessarily what their customer needs. So when you find out what your customer needs, darn it, shove everything else in the closet. Talk about that and how your company or your, what you represent is the absolute stellar, best be-all for that issue that your customer has. Because quite candidly, that's all they give a crap about. Their issue, their problem, your point, it's what they're looking for. Now, if you have done these things, if you have learned about your customer, if you have made a friend or at least had a, a warm relationship, if you found out what their need is, and if you fulfilled their need, then and only then can you ask the customer to use you. 
I believe it's like if you don't, if you just walk in and try to close a customer, it's like trying to ask somebody to marry you on the first day. Doesn't work very well. You've got to earn the right to ask customers for their business. You have to establish the credentials of your company before you can ever ask someone to use you. And this process may be one sales call, it may be 20. But if you try to skip the steps, if you try to say, okay, I'm not going to worry about knowing the customer, I'm not going to worry about developing a relationship, I'm just going to go right for the close, I think of it like a ladder with missing rungs. You're trying to get to that top ladder, but there's nothing in between. It's really hard to do. When you ask for the business, how many people here, just quick show of hands, how many people here deal in a sale where it's contractual? They walk out, they've got a signature on the dotted line. Excellent. Most of you are like me. Most of you are in a referral type business where you walk out with some sort of soft commitment where there's some, you know, promise of future, future, you know, business. That, would that be a good uh, kind of definition of what you guys do? That's what I do. Mm -hmm. and, and what's really critical here is you've got to hear the customer say yes, they will use you. The problem with that is most people hear the word maybe. What do you, when you're a kid and your parents said maybe to you, what did you hear? Yeah. You're no, I heard yes. 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 My parents said maybe it was written I mean, it would come back and say, you said maybe. Oh, yes. So, I mean, if, when we hear maybe as adults, both of us hear yes. And the problem is most salespeople do too. We've got a phone monitoring system where I can listen in on salespeople's calls. And I'll hear the guy go, so, uh, Laura, next time you need a part for your equipment, you're going you to give us a try? And then uh, Laura will go, yeah, keep in mind. I'll do my best. Again, I'll think about it. We'll definitely, definitely keep you, keep your, your number handy. <laughs> they heard everything but yes. They walk out and they go, Damn it! and I go, you got what? You got nothing. You got a no. And they heard a yes. What I train people to do is to go back in like they heard no, which always it just concerns people because they'll go maybe thinking they just shut that salesman out the door and they'll go, oh, no, 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 wait, 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 why, why aren't you going to call me? Now, the reason people don't say, people, I mean, we talked earlier about customers uh, being honest or dishonest. Customers lie all the time. They mostly lie right here. And the reason that they lie is quite simple. If they told you no, first of all, you hurt your feelings and nobody wants to offend. But second of all, you're not going to go, no? Okay, great. Well, thanks for your time. Got to go. You say, well, why? Why not? What, what did I say wrong? I thought, I thought you, you know, I had what you were looking for. So, it, it, is a, it, it is absolutely common, I do it, you do it, we all do it, that if a salesperson comes up to us on something we don't think we really want, we don't go, I really enjoyed your pitch, but I'm not buying today, so have a great day. Most of us say, oh, that's, that sounds good, yeah, thanks, I'll, let me think, I'm not talking to my wife about that one, I'm back, yeah, I did. got your card, okay, good, thanks. Um, because we want to move on and go on with something else. Well, their customers are the same way. Now, assuming you've heard the magic yes, assuming you've actually heard them give you an affirmation, Where's that number is critical. Um, where's that number means that wherever your number is, back in the old days it was a Rolodex and then it became you know, your Outlook calendar. Now it's getting what we call being on the desktop if you've got a link. Um, where however that customer needs to reference your number, you've got to be there. Because I will assure you on your first or second sales call, they didn't go home and memorize your phone number or your web address or your email address. They didn't. They took your literature and went, oh, that's interesting. I'll we'll get to that later. So you've got to make sure that you've got information in it, and you've got to make sure that your literature or your information or your whatever is where they look. Because they're not going to change their buying behaviors based on your collateral. That ain't going to happen. So if you give them a real nice brochure and they don't use brochures, tough luck for you. You've got to give them what they use, what they want. So one of the questions I always ask is, how do you look for a number? Where, where are you? Um, Spread the word. Um, this is the last one. Now, how many of you, when you make a call to a facility, like this building, how many of you have multiple points of contact? In other words, not just one buyer, you have multiple buyers. One, two, three. I, I, we, a hospital for us has countless buyers. We have all the 10 clinical engineers, and buy man, material manager, purchasing director, blah, blah. We've got lots of them. Um, a mistake a lot of people run into is they think they can turn their customer into their salesman. A uh, customer will say, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and spread the information out for you. You can just give it to me. Um, and, you know, I'll have to give it out to everybody. They don't. Customers will not become your unpaid salespeople. You have to do it yourself. Um, I'll tell you a real quick story. Um, in Atlanta, we went out to make a sales call. Atlanta has three hospitals, Grady, uh, Children's, Scottish Rights, and Northland. All within the walking distance. They call it Pill Hill. If you ever been to Atlanta? And we went to call on one of our customers, like our best customer ever. And 
the, I'm standing in the aisle as we talk to this customer here, or literally here, who had built an altar to Park Source. They had, they had hats, mugs, t shirts, collateral, it was like an altar. It's like, and they're high fiving us, going, You guys are awesome, I love you, and we are, we love you, and you're the best. And, and I'm sitting back watching this, going, Man, every sales call should just be this cool. If this guy had pom poms going, Give me a P, give me an A, give me an RTS, it couldn't have been any bigger fan. So as I'm listening to this, this raving fan right here tells how great we are. This guy right here is on the phone looking for a part, not calling my company. <laughs> and so I'm kind of torn between the two of these, going like this, going, you're looking for a part. I said, do you know anything about part source? The guy goes, what? what's part source? I go, that. <laughs> Alter. So um, he, you know, he, he never, this guy had never told this guy anything about us. And I get about halfway through my spiel to this guy, and a head pops up like one of those gophers in the, in the carnival. And I go, what are you guys doing? So I realized about that time, I couldn't ask my customers to sell for me. We had to do it ourselves. Regardless of what, because the guy said, well, why do you do all this stuff out? Yeah, well, they don't. Uh, so you got to get a hold of everybody. Um, this is what we've done. Um, this is the, the kind of the accolade sheet, if you will, of all the awards the company has won since I got there. Right out of um, so we've been pretty busy. Um, just, if, you know, if you have any questions afterwards, I think that's my last one. If you have any questions about the company, how we, you know, sell it, what I do, feel free to ask. Uh, if there's any questions, we'll be happy to fill them. Talk about um, you can't have your customer self for you internally. Mm -hmm. Maybe that can be a kind of question, candidate, in terms of you know, going above or making assumptions and things like that. How do you deal with that? I don't. You know, that's a great question. I, the, the way you avoid it is by not asking them to do it. it, it I never like asking somebody something and then later having to go above or below. So if I say to you, "Hey, do you mind handing out my literature?" You go, "Yeah, I'll be happy to help you," or I'll tell everybody about you. Then later, if I do go above, below, or sideways, I look like I didn't trust you. I look like I, I, didn't, I didn't pay attention to what you had to say. So I never ask the question. I simply deal with you on a one-on-one -on -one basis, and then later, you hang up, go on, maybe come back to the client later, talk to someone else, but never ask or put you in a position where I'm going to have to later countermand what I ask you to do. Does that answer your question? Yeah. 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 Ye